I now call to order the Society's 2,439th meeting in the 150th year since its founding on March 13th, 1871. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to PSW Sciences Spring 2021 meeting and lecture series. Because of COVID-19, the Society is bringing this meeting to you via Zoom from locations all around the world rather than our usual home the John Wesley Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, DC. Our speakers tonight are Simon Bennett and Dan Irwin of Crosswell Limited. They will be speaking about building the Elizabeth Line subway running across London, underneath some of the city's tallest buildings and some of its most historical areas. I'm Larry Milstein, President and Program Director of PSW Science, one of the oldest scientific societies of Washington, DC, founded in 1871 as the Philosophical Society of Washington to provide a forum to exchange scientific ideas, further scientific understanding and encourage scientific inquiry. This lecture is being recorded and will be posted to the PSW Science YouTube channel, where it will join over 150 other recordings of PSW Science meetings and lectures. We invite you to explore these presentations and to become a member through the PSW Science website, www.pswscience.org. The Society is grateful for the sponsorship of the 2020-2021 lecture series by the Policy Studies Organization in cooperation with the American Public University and by a donor who was asked to remain anonymous. Please join me in thanking all of our sponsors. Before we turn to the lecture, in keeping with the Society's traditions, we will welcome new members and read the minutes of the previous meeting and the summary of the previous meeting's lecture. I am pleased to announce that the following members have been elected to the society. Rita Maloff, a forensic advisor interested in criminology, molecular biology, and quantum physics, who learned of PSW from PSW member Carl Merrill. Simon Bennett and Dan Irwin, our speakers tonight, who learned of PSW through our invitation to them to give tonight's lecture and whose interests will be clear in some small part from their presentations tonight. Please join me in welcoming them all to membership. Membership is the most important pillar of the society. I encourage everyone with an interest in science to become a member. It's easy to do using the PSW Science website, www.pswscience.org. You'll find the blue join button at the upper right hand corner of the website homepage. PSW Science is a 501c3 charitable education and professional organization, dues payments and other donations to PSW Science are tax deductible. Recording Secretary James Heelan will now read the minutes of the 2438th meeting and the lecture by James Evans on building alien intelligences. James, the screen is yours. Thank you, Larry. Good evening, everyone. On April 9th, 2021, by Zoom video conference broadcast on the PSW Science YouTube channel, President Larry Milstein called the 2438th meeting of the Society to order at 8.02 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. He welcomed new members, and the recording secretary read the minutes of the previous meeting. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, James Evans, professor of sociology, faculty director of computational social science, and Director of Knowledge Lab at the University of Chicago and the Santa Fe Institute. His lecture was titled, 
Designing Alien Artificial Intelligences, Programming Beyond the Limits of Human Knowledge and Reason. Evans began with a question. What kind of artificial intelligence do we want? Scientists in the 20th century established human intelligence as the standard by which AI was measured. Scientists programmed machines to play games like checkers and chess and measured their success by competing those machines against human players. Evans questioned whether continuing to target AI to human performance is the most efficient and ethical investment. Alternatively, in 1955, William Ashby first proposed AI as amplifying intelligence. Ashby and others posited that humans could augment their intelligence by minimizing the transaction cost between human thought and objectives. Instantiations of this concept include computer mice, file systems, and EEG helmets. Asking, is that all? The speaker described 21st century competitions, including the Netflix Algorithm Prize and international chess tournaments. Ensemble teams consistently won. The speaker then posited that science has advanced through abduction, the logic process formulated by Charles Sanders Peirce, by which hypotheses are based on surprising or theory-defying evidence. According to the speaker's research, the unpredictability of a scientific paper's conclusions predicts the likelihood of the paper receiving a major award like the Nobel Prize. The most predictive factor for unpredictable papers is the novelty of the scientific team's expedition from their area of expertise. Evans said, discovery occurs in conversation between insiders who identify familiar puzzles and outsiders who solve those puzzles with alien patterns. Evans is now working on whether scientists can create alien intelligences that increase the likelihood of major scientific discoveries. Regarding his research on the replicability of published pharmacology research, Evans said findings from decentralized communities using different methods, citing to different sources, are more likely to replicate. His analysis of clinical trial data produced similar results. Evans then proposed a new vision of AI as diverse or alien alternative intelligence. He envisions diverse intelligence coaches to guide humans into thinking about things in new ways, diverse intelligence collaborators to burst bubbles of certainty created by insular thinking, and diverse intelligence coordinators to assemble teams designed to facilitate collaboration. In 2019, Nature published a paper about unsupervised AI that studied material science literature and predicted forthcoming new materials with 40% precision. Evans said the AI was successful because it was not bound by the scientific community's accepted inferences and methodologies. He then described how his research team significantly improved a similar AI's success rate by giving it general guidelines to de-randomize its crawls. The team tested their enhanced AI on scientific literature for thermoelectricity, ferroelectricity, photovoltaics, pharmaceuticals, and SARS-CoV-2 vaccination agents. Their AI consistently replicated the inferences that human researchers ultimately reached to make scientific advancements and predicted what teams would make those advancements. Algorithms considering author information were more accurate near term from the prediction, while algorithms that did not consider author information were more accurate long term. In sum, Evans said his research showed that to generate robust insight and rapidly advanced technology, scientists need an ensemble of diverse intelligences, both human and AI. In that pursuit, scientists need to design alien intelligence that is not bound by the limits of human cognitive influences. However, he cautioned that scientists must be mindful of hybrid vigor, which requires a balance of both difference and recombinability between ensemble members. After the question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speaker, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. President Milstein adjourned the meeting at 10.19 p.m. The temperature in Washington, D.C., 14 degrees Celsius. Weather, cloudy. Number of concurrent viewers on the Zoom and YouTube live stream, 91. And views on the PSW Science YouTube and Vimeo channels, 325. Respectfully submitted, James Heelan, Recording Secretary. Thank you, James. The minutes will be posted to the website in due course. Please send any corrections or comments on the minutes to corresponding secretary Robin Taylor at correspondingsec at 
pswscience.org. <clears throat> a video of the lecture is available for everyone without charge on the PSW Science YouTube channel, the PSW Science Vimeo channel, and it can be accessed directly from the PSW Science website. We now turn to tonight's lecture. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers, Simon Bennett and Dan Irwin, who, be, who will be speaking to us about one of the largest infrastructure projects in Europe, construction of Crossrail, the new Elizabeth Line subway beneath London. And they are rather heroically speaking to us from London, where it is now well after 1 a.m. Simon Bennett is head of learning legacy at Crossrail. He is a civil engineer, transport planner and communications professional. He worked on developing the original Crossrail London underground scheme and then worked on developing the project and securing powers for the undertaking. He led the consultation team and then the petitions negotiation team that saw the requisite bills through parliament. Once construction began, Simon served as head of stakeholder engagement and then program community relations manager. Dan Irwin is geospatial lead at Crossrail. He leads development of geospatial solutions to integrate and support digital building information management systems for the construction of the project and to serve as the management backbone throughout its operational lifetime. Dan has worked throughout his career as a geospatial subject matter expert in sectors ranging from the environment, utilities, transport modeling and construction through to asset and facilities management, all of which skills have been applied in Crossrail. All questions will be fielded in the Q&A session after the lecture. Simon, the screen is yours. Good evening, everybody. Uh, as Larry says, my name is Simon Bennett, and I'm currently Head of Learning Legacy at Crossrail, which I will talk about at the end of my presentation. Um, our two-hander structure will be that I will introduce the program, the project, and how we got to the construction process. Uh, Dan will then uh, give you a rundown about the use of building information management um, on the project, and I will then finish with the work that we are in at the moment in bringing that railway into use and handing that over to the eventual operator. So in terms of an introduction to what Crossrail or the Elizabeth Line is, it is a new railway in the center of London on this map here shown in red and with the inset map, which joins the existing surface railways to the east and west of London through a new tunnel, uh, 42 kilometers of tunnel uh, twin tunnel, which enable those trains which currently run in, into Termini East and West of London to continue their journey through the centre of London and thereby increase the capacity of the central area. Um, it's, uh, it runs east-west and it links a number of key areas of London, including Heathrow Airport, the new office area of Canary Wharf and the West End and the main uh, city of London, which are the, the the grey areas shown. Railways below London have been around since the beginning of the underground in 1863, built by Boulette Brunel as the Metropolitan Line. The first idea for national railway sized trains came about during the end, towards the end of the Second World War, when the country was considering how to uh, build out of the, uh, the aftermath of the war. Um, but that did not come to fruition until 1988, when a north-south route called Thameslink was opened. And then what? Well, we have the history of the Crossrail project. There was a, a study done by the, the, um, uh, the Department for Transport in 1989, which recommended a route east-west across London. And it had a, a life in Parliament from 1991 to 1994 when it fell and was not taken forward. It, it took until 2000 for it to be resurrected and a company was set up called Cross London Rail Links in 2001. 
And at that point, I rejoined the organization. We went through the process of creating a business case for the scheme in 2002, 2003. That was reviewed in 2004. And we finally got agreement to deposit a bill into Parliament in February 2005. It then took us until 2008 to get that authorization to construct the project. And the construction began in January 2009. We had the central section route already safeguarded, that being the blue line on this map. But we spent some time in 2002, 2003, looking at which routes on the surface would be the most advantageous. And we arrived at a preferred route, which is that which was subject to the Montague Review. The purpose of the railway, as I mentioned, is uh, by providing that new capacity in the very center of London, we create this impact on crowding on the existing underground. So in plenty of areas of London, we see an up to 30% decrease in crowding on the existing underground services. And along the central line, which we directly parallel in the very center of London, over 30% uh, decrease in crowding. Those are lines which were reaching their capacity and could not have continued to grow without a major scheme such as Crossrail. We also, by removing the need to change at those termini, massively decrease the journey times for key journeys within London. So from outside London to the west in Slough to Tottenham Court Road, that goes down from 55 minutes to 36 minutes. From Heathrow into the centre of London, that nearly halves as well. So these are some examples of the journey time savings, which add up to a significant benefit in our cost benefit analysis. We then went through the authorization process after having passed that review and the bill in Parliament involved authorization of our works, giving us power as the nominated undertaker to undertake the works. There are a number of uh, requirements on the project, though, known as the environmental minimum requirements, um, which we are required to comply with, including uh, a construction code about how our contractors must behave during construction. A major part of the scheme is the acquisition of land, the vast majority of that being land below ground, but we do have the, the right to acquire that. But we have the station sites at the surface, which also needed to be uh, acquired. And that was one of the powers that the bill gave us. And finally, in terms of local planning consent to the buildings that would be replaced, the, the buildings that we knocked down, that there were um, deemed permission for all of those uh, developments was within the bill. However, the detail of those is still part of the local authorities' powers and they have a thing called Schedule 7. So this picture is of us delivering the uh, documentation to Parliament, that's the Houses of Parliament, behind. We submitted the bill in February 2005 and it went through both Houses of Parliament. Select committees in the House of Commons heard um, uh, uh, 466 petitions um, on the original bill. We made additional provisions which uh, attracted another 99 petitions and it took until December 2007 for us to finish the process in the House of Commons. The process in the House of Lords was much faster, um, only 113 petitions remained by that point and we were finished in uh, May 2008 which led in July 2008 to royal assent to the Crossrail Act. There is a reason why the scheme went ahead this time when it failed in the 1990s. One being that we already had our safeguarded route through the centre of London and people were aware that the railway was coming. Um, we were impacting urban and existing railway loca locations in comparison to other railway projects which have um, attracted a great deal more uh, opposition um, because we're talking about uh, building in locations that are already built up. Um, the local authorities themselves were would directly benefit from the new station, so they were on board and positive about the scheme. The scheme had cross-party political support, and possibly most importantly, there, had, there was recently created the new Mayor of London with borrowing powers and powers to develop schemes of this nature and power to run Transport for London, the uh, Transport Authority for London, which did not exist before. At the time that we were going through Parliament, the mayor was mostly aligned with the national government in terms of political colour. Um, and we were also in a very long economic boom. So it was um, 
while these projects take a long time to develop, um, we were not uh, subject to the previous scheme where the, the boom had finished and uh, Parliament was unsure that railways would be needed in future. So then we had, uh, by, uh, once we had the Crossrail Act, we moved into the delivery process. Here are some of the uh, uh, things which show the size of the scheme and what we had to build below ground, including that um, 50 kilometres of track, 42 kilometres, which is brand new in tunnel, um, large underground spaces, including a junction, and very large stations in comparison to the underground stations, 250 metres long and much wider and much larger overall than a typical underground station. In terms of government, governance, we are sponsored by both the Transport for London and the Department for Transport. So they have a joint sponsor team which uh, sits above Crossrail and oversees it. Crossrail Limited has an independent board and an executive um, and an operator which is sits within Transport for London called Rail for London who run the Elizabeth Line brand. When the project opens it will be known as the Elizabeth Line. And in terms of funding, the reason why we have those two sponsors is that we have that the funding for the scheme comes from those two areas, the Department for Transport being the national government and TfL representing London government. TfL's funding of the scheme was 1.9 billion, but it was also responsible for one of the larger parts of the scheme with a business rate supplement, which is levied on businesses in London. And that will run into the 2030s. And that additional taxation of just under two pence in the pound on business rates is under uh, underwriting a 5.25 billion uh, uh, contribution from TfL to the construction of Crossrail. TfL, the DFT's direct funding is 4.8 billion, and there are other various strands, including the work on the national railway network, the existing surface routes, which is being done by Network Rail of 2.3 billion. These numbers are based on uh, the point at which we went into the scheme, and we have in fact uh, bust this budget, and further work has been done between those organisations to fund the, uh, the increase necessary to finish the railway, which I'll talk about at the end of the, the, uh, the presentation. In terms of construction, the tunnels in the centre of London are the larger part of it, and these are the two methods of construction. We have a platform tunnel here, which is built by a sprayed concrete lining method, and we have a running tunnel, which is built by a tunnel boring machine erecting concrete rings behind it. We have almost as much platform tunnel in terms of length as we do running tunnel. Tunnel boring happened between 2012 and 2015 with 10 drives using eight different tunnel boring machines. And these are the drives there. And we show pictures of the tunnel boring machines being launched uh, below. In terms of construction of our platforms, once we had that um, uh, sprayed concrete line tunnel that I showed before, that then has received a secondary lining and then a, uh, a, a deck for the railway and a platform uh, uh, structure which you see over here, some of which were cast in situ and some of which were brought in, um, uh, built off site and brought in. Then we uh, assembled our platform edge screen door uh, supports and you see also here some of the supports for the overhead line electrification. Then at the back of the platform, we erected a cladding system and clad that and resulted in stations which are la much larger than an underground station and with curving uh, ju uh, junctions between the adits and the platforms themselves. Um, so here are some pictures of our stations in construction and what they uh, will look like when completed. They are now largely at this stage. Um, and as well as the stations, we shouldn't forget our shafts and portals, which are significant items of infrastructure in their own right. Here we have um, uh, in the middle at the top, Stepney Green uh, ventilation shaft. We have ventilation shafts, which are part of our station buildings, which will eventually be wrapped around with developments. And here we have a portal with one of our new class three, four, five trains uh, coming out of it. So I'll now hand over to Dan to tell you about the building information uh, modeling on the program. Thanks so much, Simon. Uh, my name is Dan Irwin. Um, so I have worked for Crossrail uh, for about 10 years now. 
uh, initially as a, a geospatial uh, SME uh, and latterly the lead on geospatial uh, within the business. And what I'm going to talk to you about uh, over the next half an hour or so is how we use building information modeling or management uh, to help assist with the construction uh, of this vast project uh, across London. So um, the first thing I'll do is take you through an introduction of some of the challenges we faced, uh, as well as uh, what the history of building information looked like uh, throughout the course of this project and how we had to adapt and evolve uh, along with that. And then I'll take you through our common data environment. This is the, the framework and systems that we put in place to support uh, a lot of the construction that went on. Uh, and you can see an example of some of the output of that on your right. Uh, this is um, uh, uh, showing uh, how some of the, the construction sequencing would happen. Um, and then lastly, I'll talk about some of the uh, benefits, some of the things that worked for us, uh, and some of the innovations that we used. Uh, as well as some of the lessons learned, some of the things that didn't go so well, uh, and some future considerations for uh, any future uh, infrastructure projects that might uh, come into play. So uh, into the introduction. So uh, first of all, challenges. Um, one of the biggest challenges that Crossrail faced uh, when building, uh, uh, constructing this railway was uh, that we had to go under London, uh, which is over 2000 years old, and as such uh, has a, a very varied uh, uh, infrastructure buried underneath of it. Um, what you can see in this slide here shows an example at Liverpool Street Station of the existing infrastructure that was already in place before Crossrail came in. And what you should see in the middle uh, is, the, uh, is the Crossrail uh, station that was being built. Uh, and that included a post office uh, tunnel that had to route straight through that. And what this doesn't show, and which actually was more prevalent as well, was all of the buried utilities um, of which there were hundreds of kilometers of pipes and electrical cabling that had to be managed, um, as well as places like um, uh, archaeology sites where uh, we had to, um, you know, uh, be very wary of, of what we were trying to uh, get involved with. Um, because of this, we had to be exceedingly accurate. Um, the example here shows what was called threading the eye of the needle. So this was where one of the tunnel boring machines was passing through uh, Tottenham Court Road Station. And the yellow uh, that you can see here is the route that the TBM would take uh, through the station. Uh, the blue above it are the foundation pilings uh, of the station itself. And the red below is the platform for the Northern Line, which ran through that station. And the tolerances were exceedingly tight. Uh, the actual gap that we had between the tunnel boring machine and the foundation pilings above were about 50 centimeters. So we had about half a meter to spare and about 80 centimeters below. And because of this, we had to be exceedingly accurate with what we were doing. Um, so much so that we actually developed our own custom coordinate system um, to minimize uh, the linear distortion you get with certain projections when sort of dealing with, with this sort of stuff. Um, and uh, as opposed to a, a national coordinate system that we have in the UK where that distortion can be up to 400 millimeters over a kilometer, uh, we got that down through the use of London Survey Grid in the central operating section to about five millimeters uh, in some places. And so sure were they of the accuracy of this that when we actually came to doing the work, uh, there was only a short pause uh, in the use of that Northern Line uh, below uh, whilst we came through. But for the most part, it remained open. The next challenge we have was technical. Um, we are trying to fit a 21st century railway uh, into all of this. Uh, and we had to deal with a number of different systems from rolling stock through to systems, comms, fire safety, uh, and all of this needed to be integrated to be able to talk to, to, to each other. Uh, and, and it was going to be a very complex build. And lastly, we had a contractual challenge. Uh, we had a program of work that encompassed around 50 projects and around 200 primary contractors. And all of those we needed to be able to collaborate with ourselves and also with each other. So why use building information modeling? Um, essentially, there were a number of uh, um, uh, requirements here. Uh, we wanted to, do, to build a safe railway. We didn't want anyone to come any harm during the course of the build. We also wanted to build a world-class railway. We wanted something that was of the highest quality. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we needed to be able to collaborate with uh, our contractors and our clients uh, in order to make that build happen. 
Uh, and of course, we wanted to reduce the costs and the time taken to complete that build. So just a brief history of Crossrail with building information modeling. Um, back in 2008, when Royal Assent was first given, um, Building information modeling was a very new subject matter. It wasn't very widely um, uh, known. And in the UK, at least, there was only one standard uh, that applied to this, and that was known as BS 1192 part one. Um, it had only come out the year before, um, but it talked about the use of collaborative workflows and common data environments to support construction uh, industry. And as a result, what we started to build in 2008 onwards in terms of systems to help to, to manage this mammoth project, um, use, those, uh, use that standard as a starting point. When we start to move into the design phase, um, uh, we found that there were new standards starting to emerge. So um, we had PAS 1192 coming along part two uh, in uh, around 2011, 2012, uh, which was around uh, the construction uh, part part of, of, of a, a, a building information model um, um, uh, pro project, um, but we were already on the ground doing things. And so it was very difficult for us to just stop what we were doing and say, right, hang on a minute, there's a new standard come out, we need to go back and change everything. Um, so we weren't really uh, obliged to follow some of the things like organizational information requirements or employers information requirements that were, that were stated uh, and listed out in, in that standard. What we did have, as part of the contract that we would let is the works information. Now, this was a, uh, a, a contractual document that we would give to our contractors, which told them what information, uh, both digitally and physically, what we were expected to get back from them. Um, and this followed very closely what the employer's information requirements set out. And then um, once we got into the construction phase, um, uh, we started to see things like PAS 1192 part three come in, which was more around the handover into operations and maintenance and, and standards around that. Um, unfortunately, again, we couldn't really stop what we were doing. What we did do is we tried to rationalize a lot of the data that we were creating in terms of what we would hand over to the operator um, to try and fit as best we could those standards as they emerged. So I'm gonna talk now about our common data environment. What did we set up and how did we set it up? Um, so primarily um, the common data environment is, is really what our asset information model should be. These are the three primary data sets that are used to uh, run uh, uh, the, the, the structure or the, the infrastructure project once it's in commissioned. Um, and this is broken down into three components. First, we have the graphical model. So this is uh, uh, the, the in, in terms of what we produced, uh, our computer aided design. Uh, models, our CAD, uh, and also data that we would create through our geographic information system or our GIS. Um, we also create non-graphical data, and primarily for us, this was about asset information. Um, we were creating a lot of new assets, and all of those were going to have to be maintained once we opened the railway. Um, so the asset information was a primary focus, but as well as that, again, the GIS system holding both graphical and non-graphical data at the same time uh, um, was, was a very important part of, of what we were doing. And then the third part was documentation. Um, as, as good as a graphical model or non-graphical data can be, um, you still need documents to help to support that railway uh, once it's in operations. That might be health safety files, operation manuals, and the like. And so we had a, a, an EDMS set up for that purpose. And the three of those together formed what we call the triumvirate of uh, our common data environment. Um, there were other uh, components to this, and, and, and it wasn't just those three, um, but for, for, for the purpose of this, we're just gonna focus on those. So we're gonna look at the, um, uh, the graphical model part first. So this was uh, the CAD side of things, and what we uh, uh, went out and procured uh, shortly after Royal Assent was given was uh, a, a, a product called ProjectWise. Uh, this is a, a CAD uh, design management tool which allowed us to centralize the uh, design files that were being generated as part of this project. Latterly, we did also start using things like Synchro and SolidWorks to do some of the other stuff, which I'll come on to later. Um, in total, we've produced so far, I think about 4 million design files uh, are loaded into that system uh, and is used by all of the contractors, both uh, ourselves and the contractors, and they work with each other. Um, again, there are CAD standards around that. 
So we built a, a, a standard to ensure that all of the data that was being created was being created consistently and to a certain quality. Um, that included, for example, all of the design files uh, uh, being generated using uh, our custom coordinate system, London Survey Grid, so that you could overlay uh, two models from two different contractors uh, and for them to fit perfectly. Um, uh, and we introduced the process that was in BS 1192, uh, which was enable us to make sure that the right checks were being carried out on those design files as part of that process. Um, this included CAD QA checks, engineering content checks, and specifically the interface coordination. We needed to make sure that uh, one part of one contract that might be doing civils uh, wasn't impeding on the work that uh, structural engineers were making or that uh, 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 the uh, MEP guys uh, would, be, would be doing. And that sort of data would, you know, again, would, would be all sorts of things, um, include civils, structural, architectural, mechanical, electrical, uh, but also fire safety, uh, track, um, and all sorts of, of, of other data sets. Um, in terms of the GIS, um, uh, we used a number of different tools over the course of the project, mostly uh, from Bentley and, and Esri, uh, and this included desktop, web, and mobile technologies. What you're seeing here is a blending of both the GIS data or some of the GIS data that we had with uh, the CAD data, so that the model of the station here at Custom House um, was actually uh, coming from the CAD models. There are about 30 or 40 CAD models there in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the center there. And then we're actually using the GIS to show uh, its surroundings and other data sets that were available within the GIS and creating our own as well. Um, so you can see here that the actual rooms, for example. Um, again, uh, this uh, did also uh, have a number of standards associated with it. Um, so we had uh, a geographic information standard, um, data and metadata standards, as well as the coordinate system standard. And in total, um, there are about 57 uh, work instructions that we created uh, that would uh, allow us to manage all of the various contents that we were creating as part of this, uh, from cradle to grave uh, in, in that sense. And some of, that, some of those data sets included environmental data sets, a geotechnical data sets, land survey, uh, and topographical, um, and a, a whole host more. Uh, again, these were just some of those. Um, what you can see is uh, us showing our points of interest, and we can actually go on and see uh, uh, the model in two different views now. So what we're actually going to do is show, we've actually loaded both the design, the original design for Custom House Station, and the, the, the final construction uh, models. And you can see the difference between the two, what changed during the course of the design. Um, what we can also then do is we can actually start to interrogate this. We can actually find information that we're looking for. And this is where the power of having the information behind these models really worked. Here we're searching for lights. So this is finding us all of the lighting structures within that particular station. Um, we can also search for doors, as I'm about to do, um, and see all of the doors in that station or we can be slightly more generic and just search for mechanical components. And what you're going to see next is all of the mechanical components within that station. Um, so again, it made it very easy uh, for users to actually interrogate and find what they're looking for. Um, but we went beyond 3D uh, as well. We, we, we did a, a quite an awful lot in, in 4D modeling. Um, and what this is, is applying those 3D models and linking it to the, the work schedule that we were carrying out things with. Um, so there was a product called Primavera, which we use for our works management, and we linked in the 3D models uh, and could apply that to create con construction sequencing. And this could be done before we actually went on site and actually started to dig. Um, so we could actually see what was going to happen before it would happen. And this allowed us to then understand uh, the pitfalls and pick up any problems that might occur as a result of that, um, but also have a baseline to say what should be happening at that moment in time. Um, we did something similar with the GIS, so we did some spatio-temporal analysis, uh, and what this was about was actually understanding what was where and when. Um, what this specifically was in relation to uh, was we had sensors, hundreds of thousands of sensors uh, across the, uh, uh, the, 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 the work sites, which were monitoring particularly the, the movement of, of things as a result of the TBMs passing through. Um, 
after they passed through, there was expected to be some settlement uh, behind them, uh, but also there was noise and vibration issues that might potentially have uh, uh, thrown themselves. And if uh, uh, claims came in subsequently, um, it allowed us to go back in time to review the sensors at that point in time where the damage was supposed to have occurred, to review um, the, the position of the TBM and anything else that might have been going on at that location, and to understand whether or not the claim was valid or not. So moving on to non-graphical data, um, we, as I mentioned, were trying to create uh, an asset information uh, uh, system uh, whilst we were moving through. Typically on construction projects in the past, um, we have found that uh, asset information is collected either at the end of the project or not at all. And as a result, the operations and maintenance costs skyrocket because you don't know what's there. You don't know where things are. You don't know how they've been built. So uh, we had to create about 600,000 assets, give or take. Um, and we built a system, our asset information management system, actually inside of our document management system, um, which allowed us to actually relate documents to our assets as well. Um, and this uh, started off uh, using Uniclass as a standard, although we found very early on that Uniclass didn't really work very well for rail. Uh, it was fine for buildings. Um, but for rail infrastructure, it didn't work so well. Uh, and obviously, we were looking at things like PA, uh, ISO 55000s uh, and PAS 1192 Part 3, which I, I mentioned earlier. Um, and ultimately, what we created were our asset data de dictionary definition documents. Apologies. Uh, it, it's a bit of a mouthful, which we called AD4s for that reason. Um, and what these were, were a document for every single asset class that we were potentially creating, explaining exactly what attribution we needed to be associated with those attribute uh, with those assets and uh, how they should be collected, what they should look like. Um, the process by which we developed our asset breakdown structure uh, in, in the way we, we were storing things uh, was hierarchical. So we would start with a primary functional unit for a given facility, for example, and this might be your drainage system, or it might be your lighting system, or it might be your fire safety system. Um, and this encompassed all of the assets that fell within that. And then potentially, uh, although not in all cases, we would then go down into a functional, functional unit. So this would be a subsystem within that system. And finally, we would go down into the asset and equipment level. Um, now, the asset actually was defined not as a, a physical thing, but as a requirement. It is, it is a requirement to fulfill uh, a purpose at that location. So you might be in need of a drainage pump, for example, to stop uh, water ingress. And as a result, you have an asset that is uh, a drainage pump, and then you have a piece of equipment which you would put in place uh, to fulfill that requirement. What it meant was is that we could take the equipment piece out and replace it with a different piece of equipment if necessary without having to remove the asset uh, itself because the requirement still existed. And we also were collecting uh, non-graphical data through the GIS. As I mentioned, there were a whole different host of, uh, uh, of data sets that we would create, about two or 300 uh, map layers in all. Uh, and again, we were using Esri and Oracle as, as a relational database behind all of this, to host all of that data. Um, and all in all, we produced about 400 million data features over the course of the project, and it's still ongoing to, to this day. Um, um, but what we also did was we started being able to link our data sources. We saw earlier the 3D model uh, that was inside of our GIS. Uh, we could link to that, but we could also link <clears throat> to our document management system or our estates management system or our master data model, uh, which I'll, I'll come on to in a bit. Um, the example here, this is a, uh, an example from ProjectWise. This is a drawing that we have here. And uh, if we zoom out a bit, <clears throat> what we should find is a, an equivalent structure inside the GIS, which has the same location code. And what that meant is we could start attaching things to it. We could start creating relationships. We could actually start seeing those drawings <clears throat> inside the GIS and, and making them available through a single interface for users to be able to go and find them. And we could actually round trip the whole thing. You could go from project wise to the GIS and back again, or you could open a PDF rendition of that document and because most people didn't have uh, a CAD software on their machines. Um, but they did have a PDF reader. And so having a PDF uh, made available to them uh, and having those drawings made available to them made it much, much easier. 
And then finally, we come on to documentation. Again, we use Enterprise Bridge, which is a, a web-based uh, tool for, for hosting documents. Uh, I think, again, at the moment, we have about 6 million documents in that system, uh, covering a wide range of things. Um, we use a, a number of different standards in order to build that. Um, but ultimately, the process was that we would have uh, central document controllers who would sit uh, inside of Crossrail Limited, uh, and they would manage site-based document managers that would be associated with the contractors and help them, assist them to, uh, to, to create documents, to upload documents, to manage the documents within, uh, within that system. But it was one system that everybody used. And again, the sorts of data that we're creating were health safety files, operation manuals, and also PDF renditions of drawings, as I mentioned, uh, from, uh, from the CAD system. But what um, Enterprise Bridge did and what, what, what that system did as well was not just document management. That was one strand of what it actually did. Um, it was also managing our contracts, uh, our asset breakdown structure, as we, as we saw uh, earlier when looking at our asset information. Um, our cross rail management system, which essentially was where our standards were kept uh, and where our other policies and procedures were uh, uh, stored. Uh, our assurance reporting, our materials compliance, the list goes on. Um, and lastly, I wanted to talk about the master data model. Now, this essentially underpins everything we've just talked about or everything I've just talked about. Um, it didn't exist at the beginning of the project and it was realized fairly early on that we did have disparate systems. We had a document management system and a CAD system and a GIS system and other systems out there, um, but they weren't talking to each other. And because they weren't talking to each other, um, it meant that uh, people were going off and naming things uh, what they wanted to name them. There was no standard around naming conventions. There was no consistency around the naming conventions. And so this tool was built uh, to help to manage that, to make sure that there was consistency between these different systems and act as an integration tool between them. Um, it was a custom piece of software. It was built in-house, uh, web-based. And um, essentially what happened was, is we had data owners. Uh, I myself was the data owner for the location part that you can see here. Um, and this is where change would happen. If we had to change the code for something, uh, a station, or a shaft or a portal, um, we would change it in this location here. And then that would be our configuration management. And then the other systems would uh, either have that pushed out to them or would pull it depending on the system. But it meant that the systems were in sync and we could actually rely on the consistency. So that was our common data environment. We built all of this stuff, but how did it actually benefit uh, Crossrail? Um, well, the first thing that, that it did was, was it gave us great visibility of design. Uh, we could actually understand what was happening out on site even before it started. Uh, as I mentioned, with the construction sequencing, it meant that we could actually understand what we were doing before we went out. It also meant that we had better management of that design. We could actually uh, uh, use that to, to do things like clash detection. Having those models, uh, uh, particularly the coordination models that were generated, it meant that we could uh, uh, cross-discipline uh, check uh, that to make sure that you know, what someone was building uh, from a civil perspective uh, wasn't going to be impacted by something that an MEP uh, engineer was going to be making. Um, again, we mentioned uh, the, the automation of the CAD uh, uh, quality assurance. And what that meant was that people didn't have to worry about whether it fitted uh, in terms of the, the level naming conventions, the global positionings, um, that was all done as part of that quality assurance. And that meant that the data had integrity. It meant that people trusted it. It meant that they actually understood that everything was going to be of that same quality. And it also meant that we could uh, apply better resource management. Um, again, with something like the construction sequencing, we could see exactly what was going to happen and we knew uh, what was needed and when, both in terms of material, in people, uh, and in, in time. And we understood the physical environment better. Um, we go back to the uh, example of the, the TBMs passing through the grounds um, and actually knowing where all of these buried structures were uh, before we started that piece of work meant that we could, uh, we could do a lot of work to uh, overcome those challenges before we ran into them. 
And it also meant that we have greater performance analysis capability. It meant that we could uh, actually analyze where we said we would be at a given moment in time against where we actually were. And you'll see this in the next slide in terms of our innovations. So we had a, a whole series, there was a whole program called Innovate Team, uh, which actually uh, looked at using innovations to help Crossrail. Um, the first of which I'm just gonna pick on a few here. Uh, the first of which was a, a Bluetooth low energy beacons. Uh, one of the big problems we had when you were out on site is that you couldn't geolocate yourself uh, when you were using a, a mobile device. So we uh, put in Bluetooth uh, low energy beacons to help that geolocation. And this became particularly useful when we started looking uh, at uh, augmented reality. Uh, this was something that we actually took those 4D models that we were producing and put them onto mobile devices and put them out on site. So actually what you could do is you could actually overlay the 4D model at a given moment in time. And this is where we should have been in terms of the construction and relay that against what was actually being built. So we, again, we could do that performance analysis on site. We also played with virtual reality. Um, here is an example uh, of uh, a, a, an app that was put together um, that again took those, those models and that information that we were collecting throughout the course of the project and made it very accessible to users to be able to walk around the station and understand the station, um, which is very useful for the station operators and maintainers to actually be able to uh, familiarize themselves with the stations before uh, they were even ready uh, to be used. And we also did on-site document verification. Traditionally, uh, what would happen is that uh, there would be a, 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 someone would go on site with a document uh, relating to a piece of work that, that they would undertake, and it might be a hard copy or it might be a PDF that they've, they've downloaded onto their device. But quite often, it wasn't the right version, that it had changed since they had looked at it. And having this app on your phone, um, you could simply scan a QR code and it would check and tell you whether or not you were using the right version of the document. And if you weren't, it would give you the option to take you to the correct version to use. We also uh, implemented virtual information structures. Again, this was more around our uh, asset information, um, but the way that it was designed using object-oriented design uh, of, of that data meant that we could uh, repackage it uh, to, to fit a different purpose. When we collected the information, it was very contractor centric. Uh, we had contracts and they would deliver back asset information to us. But when we want to hand over to the operator or maintainer, they're not really interested in the contractor perspective. They're interested in the operations perspective that is more facility based. Uh, and having these information, uh, the vir virtual information structures in place meant that we could recontainerize re that information uh, and package it in a way uh, that could be accepted by uh, the people we were handing over to. We also use smart boards, particularly during design review. So once we got to a certain part uh, of the design uh, life cycle, there would be a design review carried out and we would have smart boards in the room uh, with the uh, coordination models loaded up, which people could interact with uh, in the room rather than having sheets of paper or, or flat uh, uh, sort of documents to work from. Uh, they could actually interact with that model and understand it far more intuitively than they could by uh, uh, other means. Uh, and it was, it was very useful in helping to move those design reviews along uh, and to uh, eliminate more risk. And then there was the use of mobile GS, which we, we, we started using sort of halfway through the project. Um, and primarily what we used this for was for data gathering exercises whilst out on site, um, but particularly for managing our site boundaries. Um, we had a number of construction sites uh, around London uh, and we had to be very careful about the hoarding that we placed around those to make sure it was in the right place. What we didn't want was hoarding being placed where it shouldn't and trespassing on land that wasn't ours or conversely not putting hoarding where we should, where we were responsible for any accidents that might happen. Um, so we used the mobile GIS to allow users on site to actually see where the hoardings were uh, or where they should be. Uh, to, to geolocate themselves and figure out whether or not they were actually in the right place. So in terms of benefits realization, um, we, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, uh, there were a number of sort of reasons why we wanted to use building information modeling. Um, the first of which was safety. Here you can see an example uh, at Westbourne Park, which is just west of the, the underground section. And what we had to do was create a, an elevated bus deck um, to allow uh, us to 
uh, uh, to work around um, uh, what was the traditional bus deck, um, which, which was going to get in the way of the construction. Um, because we were able to do this 4D modeling, this construction sequencing, it meant that we could improve our understanding of how it was being done, and we could eliminate any mistakes before they occurred in terms of the sequencing that was going to happen, uh, that we didn't have people in the wrong place at the wrong time. And it also demonstrated that we were able and ready to dig. Because of this as well, we had uh, an improvement in quality. Again, the use of the coordination uh, and the, the, the interoperability of data uh, between these different data sources and the fact that they were integrated, it meant that the quality of the data was higher. We could go back and do rework at a very early stage to eliminate problems that we might find with the design. Um, and it also it improved the temporal quality. And what I mean by that is it improved the, um, the, 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 the construction sequencing so that we could uh, eliminate any duplication of efforts uh, and reduce any overlap that we might find uh, between two events that might be taking place at the same time. And then lastly, there was collaboration. Um, so this, uh, having this sort of central set of tools that was available to everybody, both uh, Crossrail and contractor alike, meant that uh, we had just one system for managing it. It reduced the overhead for us. Rather than having to have a separate system for every contract, um, we just had the one system that was central, uh, and it reduced the overhead of managing that. And it made it access easier. Um, you know, people knew that there were only two or three systems that you had to access um, to get to what you needed. And in some cases, like through the GIS, you could actually go into that one system and actually find the information in those other systems uh, directly. In terms of some specific cost and time savings, um, there are a number of different things we did with CAD uh, that helped us uh, with, with what we were doing. And uh, on average, uh, we were looking at about 31 person days a month per contract were being saved because of these tools. It reduced the repetition of tasks. We automated a lot of things uh, to reduce that repetition that would be happening. Um, and it, it just made things happen much, much more smoothly. Um, from the GIS perspective, uh, again, the intelligent design and the integration of the GIS with the CAD uh, improved uh, the early planning in particular. Um, there was a retrospective analysis done uh, of some of the uh, uh, work that was carried out on the, uh, the design um, of, of, the, of, of the actual route. Uh, and we found that because of what we've done uh, with both the CAD and GIS integration, we were saving about 5,000 hours a year uh, worth of rework that would otherwise have to have been done. Um, most people were finding about a 15% uh, decrease in the time it took to find things because of, they could go through a single um, uh, spatial platform, which made things easier to find. Um, in the case of the estates management uh, team, which was looking at the uh, occupation and ownership uh, uh, of, of the sites uh, during the construction, they found that they actually reduced the time it took them to create and manage that information by 75%. Uh, and it saved them about £120,000 per year. Uh, from a modelling perspective, we've already seen many examples uh, of uh, construction sequencing. Um, at Farringdon Station, uh, we created a 3D model and linked it to the delivery programme. Um, it cost us money to create. And it, you know, that did cost us £120,000 to put together. But what it did do is it managed to reduce our risk contingency by £8 million because we were able to prove that we were ready and that there were no issues uh, that we would run into during that construction. And then lastly, there was uh, asset information management. Now, we weren't going to save any money uh, creating asset information. As I said before, uh, mostly asset information is collected at the end or not at all. Um, so anything we were doing during the project was going to cost. Um, however, um, if we didn't collect that information, it was uh, forecast that uh, the, the cost of operation and maintenance of the railway uh, afterwards would increase by up to 20 to 25 percent. Um, now bear in mind we've been at this for 10 years um, and the operational uh, lifespan of Crossrail is, is estimated at 120 years. Uh, so when you start to look at the uh, savings you can make, uh, which worked out to be about 44 million a year by having the, this information up front um, and extend that out over 20 or 40 years, you now find yourself looking at savings of 800 to 1.7 billion uh, pounds. 
but it wasn't all plain sailing. Um, you can see in this example here, uh, there were some issues uh, throughout the course of the project. It wasn't, you know, uh, it wasn't just a, a wonderful uh, thing. Um, uh, in this example here, it, it did transpire that, uh, as I understand it, the, um, the, the technical drawings didn't follow the standards that we put in place, and that's why uh, we had the issues that we had. But we did also have some early contract issues. Some of the contracts were let uh, before we had these systems in place. And um, I guess the lesson learned here is that what was given back to us wasn't fit for purpose for what we needed it for. Um, and we've had to do a lot of rework um, to get that back in place, and we're still paying the price now. Um, we also found because we had these big centralized systems, um, we started to suffer from vendor and even version lock-in. Um, it was very difficult once we were in using a, a particular piece of software to actually go off and use something else. And even to the extent where we couldn't even change versions of the software and we started to lag behind as the project continued to deliver um, uh, and, and, and it, you know, the software would become out of support. Uh, we also found that some software that was being developed um, was being developed more from an IT and technology perspective rather than uh, what was actually needed on the ground. And as a result, we did see some cost spiral in terms of, of what was being developed and, and what was being developed didn't necessarily fit what we needed. Uh, one example of, of something that we, we tried to do very early on uh, is one of the first contracts that was let uh, was the development of a common object model library. So what this is, is a set of common components uh, which you can then share. Um, this might be signaling uh, equipment or, or track or, or doors or, or whatever it might be. Um, and the idea was if we could create that, then it would reduce the time that each of our contractors would have to spend on creating those themselves. Um, unfortunately, this is you know, back in 2008, 2009, and it was a step too far for us. We, we, we really shouldn't um, uh, have expected that to work. Um, the systems in place were not good enough to be able to do that, and, and it never delivered. We also found that data interoperability was an issue. I mean, I've talked about uh, all of these uh, systems being in place uh, uh, that were talking to each other, and that is true, they, they did, um, but behind the scenes, um, there was a lot of uh, 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 moving of data from one place to another. We didn't really achieve true op interoperability um, because a lot of the systems didn't allow for that. And what we instead had to do was, was do extract transform load operations to move data between those systems, most of which were automated so that we didn't have to worry too much about it. Um, but the true, that, that interoperability is still an issue to this day. We, we still haven't really cracked that one. And then lastly, there's handover. Um, we are, as, as Simon mentioned, handing over to RFL, uh, who are Rail for London, who are gonna be the operator and maintainer of this. Um, and I think there was uh, um, an issue with the client expectation management. I think they were expecting maybe um, something more than we were going to provide, uh, or in some cases less. Um, and certainly some of the systems that they have in place, um, uh, can't support some of the stuff we've developed. Some of these amazing uh, models and, and, and sequences that you've seen here uh, can't be run by them on their systems. And so, although it was great for Crossrail to have developed them and has helped us, um, that sort of thing is not something we can really hand over. So, um, just in terms of future considerations to wrap up, um, you know, if we could go back and do it all again, um, and I'm surely to hope we wouldn't, um, uh, one of the first things we do is, is probably look at requirements. Um, we needed to establish them as early as possible. And as, as I mentioned, um, you know, uh, where we didn't do that early enough, we, we saw issues um, and understand what the client wants more. Um, there was, there was you know, some disparity between what we, we thought the client wanted and what the client actually wanted. Um, so getting a clear understanding of those requirements much earlier in the, in the process uh, would have helped us an awful lot more. Uh, and in terms of the asset classification as well, that really was key to, to, to understanding what assets we were going to be building uh, and what assets we were going to hand over. Um, in terms of data configuration management, we became a very data-centric organization. Uh, historically, uh, I don't think construction projects have ever created this much content uh, as part of the project. Um, 
And although we created a lot of data, uh, and I've talked about you know quality assurance uh, and model reviews and everything else that went with that, um, we maybe didn't um, uh, treat that data as as the valuable resource that it actually is. Um, you know, going forwards into operations and maintenance, we're going to find more and more that that data is going to drive uh, our, our management uh, maintenance regimes. Um, certainly, the use of relational data models from the start would have helped save us more money. And then, lastly, people. Um, ultimately, this is all about people. Um, people are the ones that are creating this content. People are the ones that are using this content. And so, um, people have a way of doing things. And uh, I think that. Um, more could be done to uh, make people aware uh, of, of why we do what we do uh, and, and influence their behaviours and outcomes. Um, we did create uh, something called the Crossrail Information Academy, uh, of which you can see an example on the right here. Um, and that was something where we got all of the Crossrail people in, all of the Tier 1 contractors in, to explain to them why this was important, why it was useful, why it benefited both us and them uh, to go down this route. Um, and hopefully that uh, is something that uh, is, is a legacy that will, will persist beyond uh, the end of this project. Thank you, Dan. Um, so I'll now uh, wrap up about where we are currently on the programme and the, the last phases of the scheme. So Dan's talked a bit about the railway systems that we have, and that has been the major challenge and probably the reason why the line has not yet opened and is in fact uh, uh, on, not on schedule anymore. Um, we have um, a huge amount of, of, of railway systems, not just track and electrification, but obviously the tunnel lighting, radio systems, etc. And the sheer amount of this and the amount of uh, documentation and assurance and making sure that it all worked together ended up being, I think, more of a challenge than was understood at the early parts of the program. And I think a good re a reason for that is that it is um, a smaller part of the total cost of the scheme in comparison to the tunnelling, which is very expensive, but actually turned out to be relatively easy. Um, so the focus gets put on that part of the pro program, which is very expensive, and the bits that are, are less expensive perhaps were, were left in a way that they shouldn't have been. So we have the, the tunnel uh, uh, systems. We also had to uh, have our track installation. And here I wanted to talk specifically about um, the types of track that we used. Here we see a, um, a track being installed uh, in the running tunnels in the normal way, which is bringing it in as panels and then concreting it in. Um, but we also had floating slab track, which is uh, uh, cast into a resilient uh, 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 substrate that um, reduces the amount of vibration and therefore noise and preferred vibration into buildings above. There are a couple of areas in London where there are significant um, receptors uh, which are uh, very sensitive. That would be in Soho, just south of Oxford Street, where a lot of our film studios uh, and recording studios are. Throughout that whole area, we re were required to use um, uh, floating uh, slab track. Um, and very particularly under the Barbican Concert Hall in the City of London, we actually were required to uh, provide a very specific type of track, which was actually uh, on springs rather than, uh, than a resilient pad. And that was phenomenally expensive and actually ended up being um, way beyond what was necessary to uh, protect the concert hall above. Um, so were we to do that again, we would probably have uh, uh, worked with the city to, to have just standard floating track slab instead. Um, we have the, um, the station systems um, and the, the big issue of um, uh, our systems uh, has been the systems integration, making sure that all of these systems work together and particularly where there is the interface between the running railway and the station. So the train is the point at which those uh, link together. And um, the key part is the signalling system. We are running a new system in the centre of London, that's shown here in the, in the, the green signalling, which is cab-based train control, but it is connecting to those surface railways I talked about, and those have existing network rail conventional signalling. And there are two different styles of, of that. In the east, we have uh, original style uh, network rail conventional system with um, uh, automatic warning system and track protection and warning system type signalling. 
In the West, however, we have European train control system level two, um, and the train has to be able to operate in each of those uh, systems and hand over at the points at which it moves from one and to the other. And getting that software right such that the train can, can talk to each of those signaling systems. And then when it pulls into a station that it can talk to the station system so that the platform edge doors are controlled with the train has been one of the biggest challenges on the program. And is one of the reasons why we have spent you know, several years now uh, beyond the time at which we were expected to open. Um, this is our train, a class 345 built by uh, Bombardier in Derby in the UK, but a Canadian company has since been sold to Alstom. Um, and as you see on the right, it's um, uh, a metro style train. While it's a national railway size train with overhead line electrification, different to the tube, it does have a continuous walkway all the way through the carriages and the vast majority of the seating is longitudinal on the side, so creating a great deal of standing space so that in that central section of London it can have the highest possible uh, capacity. These trains are air conditioned, which is a new thing for uh, the tube. Most people uh, who use the underground will know that every uh, other line on the underground is, is not air conditioned um, and they are much longer and larger than, than the, the sorts of trains that we that we have at the moment. Um, those surface sections are, uh, while a smaller part of the scheme, were also important to the project and they required um, upgrading, in some cases providing electrification, overhead line electrification, uh, and rebuilding of stations to lengthen them for the longer trains and to provide new ticket halls. And some of these pictures here show uh, our new flyover that we had to build um, so that the tracks into, um, into Heathrow um, were um, uh, had a second um, uh, second route, which is this area here. Um, this is Ilford Station, and this is Acton Main Line Station. This is the new station building, and this is the old one. So you can see that we're having we're building significantly larger stations to cater for the numbers of people that we expect to run to use the new railway. So we are now in our commissioning and handover phase. Um, we've handed over two stations, Custom House and Farringdon to Transport for London and are in the very last stages of Tottenham Court Road as we speak. Um, throughout this year, all the central section stations except Bond Street will be handed over. So here we see some finished stations, um, a platform level at Tottenham Court Road and the station concourse at Farringdon. And we are, um, Moving from dynamic testing, which is up until quite recently, we've been uh, testing the trains in tunnels uh, in, in motion, that's dynamic testing. We're now moving into trial running. So we have changed from being a construction site on which trains can be run to do testing to a railway on which we have to get permission to can finish the construction. So we are now an operating railway. While not carrying passengers, we run on the same rules the, the existing railways do. So we have our uh, route control centre at Romford here, which is uh, managing the, uh, the infrastructure. So throughout this year, uh, we will be handing over to Transport for London Rail. TfL Rail are already operating services to the east and the west uh, into Liverpool Street to build up the reli reliability of those new, new trains. And they, uh, in some cases, they started out as a seven car uh, unit and are now being built up to the full nine car full length trains. So here we have one of our trains in Heathrow Station and again at Romford. So the opening phases for the scheme, we already have delivered the uh, stages uh, 1, 2A and 5A. The the, these numbers are out of sequence now because of the fact that the project is, uh, is delayed from its original opening date. But the really key part is the stage where we open the central section. So that is stage three. That's expected to be open in the first half of 2022 and we'll be running trains then from Abbey Wood through to Paddington through that central section. However, we will essentially have three separate railways. We'll have the existing uh, line into Paddington high level, the existing line in the east to Liverpool Street high level and the central section. We'll bring the whole thing together in the following year, throughout 22 or into early 2023, uh, certainly by the end of 22 is the plan, um, so that we will then have the full 24 train per hour service in the central section um, uh, in the peaks. Um, we uh, 
a decision was made that the line when open and when operating would be known as the Elizabeth line and we announced that uh, five years ago now uh, sorry uh, four years ago uh, and this is the Queen uh, receiving the uh, uh, the plaque when the, the um, uh, when the, the renaming happened um, I'd just like to take a few slides now to talk about our sustainability story because there are a couple of things that I think are particularly important about the way we approach the project um, we have um, uh, looked at the carbon uh, impact of the project and uh, based on the um, predictions for at the beginning of the scheme we've delivered a reduction of 11 percent against the carbon that was expected to be embodied in the project and we've done um, several other important things including using the excavated material from our tunneling to create a new wetland habitat out towards the east uh, of uh, more or less in the Thames estuary a little bit round the round around the coast um, on a piece of land which was reclaimed where the seawall has been breached and the excavated material from Crossrail has been used to create buns. This is going to create a new uh, wetland habitat for, for birds, for the Royal Society for Protection of Birds. And then one of the areas which people are always particularly interested in is the archaeology. In some cases we're obviously building stations, uh, the tunnel boring machines uh, go below the level of any uh, human interaction with the ground, but at station sites we were in some cases digging into roads which had not been dug over many times. So at Liverpool Street, and that's the top right here, you can see the, bed, the burial ground for the Bedlam Hospital. Um, and there were 3,000 skeletons here which needed to be exhumed. And in the end, we were running that archaeological site 24 seven to uh, get it done before the, uh, the, the work was needed to start. And then on the, on the, on the left there, you can see the, um, uh, the uh, excavation of the Brunel engine sheds to the west of Paddington station with a, a picture of that uh, above it. So you can see that this um, was originally a broad gauge uh, engine shed and then had uh, it was uh, changed to standard gauge for those of you who are railway geeks and understand those things. And finally, this is the work that I now do, the Crossroad Learning Legacy. We work with the uh, professional institutions in the UK and with our successor major projects to collate the work which we have done and um, create papers based on our experience and this uh, presentation I think is an example of that where we want to share what we have done so that others can learn from it take what we've done that is good and learn from where we where we could have done things better so we have a Crossrail learning legacy website and I'd recommend anybody going to look at that and looking at the 12 themes within that and anything that would interest them in terms of uh, how a major project is is built so that's the end of the presentation, and I think I'll now pass over to Larry, who will um, manage the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Simon and Dan, uh, for a very interesting talk on a very large project of interest to uh, all of us here and throughout the world. So we have time for the Q&As. Uh, so we'll start with uh, Frederica Derema. Federica is a PSW member and she was formerly head of the Air Force Laboratory of Research. Federica. Yes, good evening. Uh, thank you very much, both speakers, for an outstanding kind of uh, presentation of an, ex of an outstanding project. And as a physicist and a computational scientist, I, in a sense, uh, saw a, 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 a proof that such a project could not have been um, possible without the information technology that you used. So I asked a question early on when you talked about 4 million design files. And I said, I kind of asked how many, what was the size of the data? And I know that there were multiple sets of data. Uh, and then, you know, I, I, I wanted to also, in relation to that, ask, um, you also use the uh, computational modeling, finite element methods, and what computational resources you used for that. Then you talked about instrumentation and sensing, and certainly that is for the design uh, cycle, but also at the operational cycle, because you talked about how you want to develop methods uh, so that the maintenance, in a sense, does not become, you know, um, uh, both uh, the static and, 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 and the old, uh, uh, but more dynamic and real-time 
and continuous kind of test and evaluation. So can you speak a little bit about um, uh, uh, these issues, how you address them and how you include them in the project? Uh, Daniel, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, in terms of the size of the design files, I mean, obviously each file varied in size depending on what was in it. Um, yeah. We're talking terabytes of data here. Um, each file would be uh, separated into its own own unique space and would be versioned as well. So we might have 15 or 16 versions of a given design file as it evolved throughout the project. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't know the exact number, but I know it was it was terabytes of data that we, we were storing and, and are storing to this date. Um, in terms of the um, uh, the use of the the sensors uh, and and how they were used throughout the construction project. Um, most of those were dismantled um, around, I, I don't know exactly, it was about 2016, Simon? Can you remember exactly when? Talking specifically about the, the, the monitoring of buildings, I can talk about that. Yeah, um, yeah that's the, yeah, I mean, those are the sort of things. There's sides to this question. There's, uh, there's the, the temporary works, uh, the temporary monitoring that we did during the works, and then there's mm. the um, sensors and data and remote sensing that we have in what we've built so that the main the, the IM can use it and I know there yeah. is some of that um, so yeah. I'll talk about I, I can talk about the, the the tunnel monitoring the major the purpose mm. for this was um, obviously we were predicting ground settlement above uh, our, our tunnels and also particularly above mm. where our uh, excavations were happening from the surface so in some cases we had um, you know dozens of uh, uh, automatic total stations um, on uh, buildings around the uh, uh, at surface level, with um, prisms erected all over the all over the place. So these were real time monitoring the movement of buildings, um, so that when uh, if if movement was above a certain threshold, alarms would go off. There was the ability to uh, increase the amount of uh, gra compensation grout being pumped into the ground between the tunneling and the surface to uh, to, to push the, the buildings back up. Um, and as a result of that, we had very few damage claims because our compensation grouting was pretty effective. Um, mm. But it did require us to take areas of of surface land that we wouldn't otherwise have had to create those compounds for the, the compensation grouting. Uh, we dismantled all of that very quickly within a, inside a year after the tunneling completed. And we yeah. moved to a satellite interferometry method of uh, managing uh, the long-term settlement of ground. Um, here you're, you're well within the sort of 10 millimeters that happens as a result of seasonal change anyway, um, but we wanted to keep, keep an eye on it and we wanted to make sure that we were able to uh, defend claims that came uh, for uh, after. So there's a very useful, good paper on learning legacy about use of the satellite um, imagery to, to uh, manage our settlement from there on after that temporary monitoring was taken down. Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I was going to say the INSAR uh, satellite monitoring is, is the primary method now by which we keep track of that settlement, um, uh, potential for settlement that might be occurring. Um, in terms of uh, sort of going forward in, uh, into operations and maintenance and uh, sensors for, for managing that list, there are a variety of different sensors on the track. We also have uh, a number of onboard uh, sensors on, on some of the, the, the trains, both the uh, passenger trains and some yellow plant. Uh, which can run the tracks and actually automatically check for uh, track defects or other, other issues that might occur. Uh, and they're going through their testing phases at the moment. Um, I, don't, I think they'll, they'll be uh, sort of rolled out fairly soon. Does that answer the questions? Uh, I think we'll take a question from Phil Nicholson and then a question from Giovanni. Uh, Phil, Philip. Uh, you have to unmute. Hey, uh, I was working, I'm a geotechnical engineer. I was working at the Boston Big Dig, which was about $15 billion. And also in, Atl in a, Toronto with a 28 kilometers of a subway. I wonder what was the soil investigation? Was it clay, rock, or what oh, was the water table? All of the above. All together. Um, and the second question I have, well, the station, 
built before tunneling or after tunneling or oh. during the tunnel? Right. So I can I think I can answer both of those. And the answer to both of those questions is both. Um, so uh, what is, it, you know, uh, is many fold. So when talking about geotechnics, the vast majority of Crossrail's tunnels are in clay. They're in clay. clay. It's quite a, a homogeneous medium. It's extremely easy to dig, um, particularly when you're at tunnel boring machine level, which is between 17 and 25 meters below ground, which is which is quite a long way down. Um, in terms of encountering things like sand lenses and um, water uh, in the ground, there are only a couple of areas where that was an issue in the central area. And Farringdon is the main one because Farringdon has a significant number of faults in it. Yes. It's also the area where the, the Fleet River runs. Um, there's again, papers on the Learning Legacy about this and I'm, I'm not a geotechnical engineer, but I, I know them well. Um, so building Farringdon station was, uh, was quite difficult, but the really lucky part of that was that Farringdon station largely sat below Smithfield Market which was one single structure and it had an underground car park so we had the ability to take over significant parts of that car park and use it for compensation grouting the compensation grouting which was undertaken at Farringdon was phenomenally extensive and it was all obviously real time um, so that was managed relatively well there were a couple of other places particularly at the uh, western end of Liverpool Street station uh, on the uh, escalator um, incline up to Moorgate station where we encountered a thing called a drift filled hollow which was where um, silt had fallen uh, had been uh, washed into an area uh, below the surface and that that uh, ended up needing uh, ground freezing as well as compensation. Yes, we did that yes that's good thank you. Yep. Thank you. Uh, and then the we second part piece, is that, sorry and and then the, the other part of the, 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 the other type of significant uh, uh, um, ground there was, was chalk uh, and waterlogged chalk, oh, where chalk. we were tunneling under the River Thames. So we had two different types of tunnel boring machines. The vast majority of it was uh, in the clay, but we had um, slurry machines running under, under the River Thames and the chalk came out very wet, needed to be dried out before it was taken away. So that, that didn't go to the Wallasey Island um, uh, wetland habitat that I talked about. Um, that was the question about the geotechnics. I've forgotten the yes. second question already. Thank you very much. The second question. Yeah, the second question was about the station. I, the station that were built before the yes. tunnel or after. Some of them before and some of them after. Um, it was <laughs> it was based on where the station appeared in the drive. So um, with um, Canary Wharf there was the opportunity to build the box for the station first. Yeah. The tunnel boring machine then broke through that box and was tracked through it and, and, and carried on. Um, and um, But in the west, we were digging the tunnel first and then broke that out. So at Paddington, for example, the tunnel boring machines came through first before the, the, the box station had reached that level. And then those rings had to be broken out. Um, so uh, it depended on where it was in the drive. Good. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Good night. <laughs> Thank Good you. Night. Uh, Phil, Philip, I guess you can, you can speak now. Yep. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen, for a very interesting talk, and I appreciate you staying up this late to give it. Uh, I had a fairly simple question. You, you mentioned the uh, clearance in some cases for the tunnels was as little as 50 centimeters from neighboring mm. structures and that you needed millimeter accuracy mapping. So for the mapping, I understand, but how did you keep track of the positions of the TBMs themselves while they were doing their work? I imagine 20 meters is too deep for uh, GPS satellite systems to work. Yes, as I understand it, the main way of checking, because obviously the TBM has, has a reckoner of how far it's gone. And so what you're really doing is checking the accuracy of that, is that you set up a set of um, prisms and uh, reflectors back down the tunnel and you extend the survey grid via laser um, uh, survey equipment instruments, mm. take you right back out to the, to the tunnel entrance to a known point. So it's kind of old fashioned surveying, but with lasers and things. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, if, I, if I could, uh, a somewhat related question. I remember reading somewhere in one of the Crossrail brochures 
that the tunnel boring machines were in fact left in place at the end of the project. They were dug off into side tunnels and they were not disassembled and brought out again. I just wondered what was the reason for that? They must be phenomenally expensive pieces of equipment. Um, I, I love this question. Two of the shields were buried, but most of them weren't. So we had eight TBMs, as I mentioned. Um, six of those were recovered in their entirety. The, the only two which were buried were the two which came from the east into Farringdon. And the reason for that was that they uh, um, arrived at the station at the point that the station had already been finished. So they couldn't be popped out into the station to be, to be uh, there was no way of, of, of removing them. The ones that had come from the west could be. Um, but the bit that you bury is just the shield. It's sort of essentially the mm. first 10 meters and the cutter head. Now the cutter head, is a sacrificial thing anyway, really. Its mm -hmm. teeth are being replaced all the time. So by the time it arrives there, it's it's life expired. The can is only about, you know, the, very, the, the first 10 meters is not the most expensive bit of the machine. All the guts of the machine, all the train, the the um, uh, everything that hangs out the back where the, the segments are brought in, the conveyor for the excavator material to go out, and obviously the cab and everything that's inside the, the, the TBM shield where all the electronics is, all of that's recovered and taken back out the tunnel all the way to where it, where it started. So in terms of the, the total cost of a TBM, you're recovering, I would say, 80% of it. Okay, that makes much more sense. Thank you, I feel better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. Okay, we have a question uh, from a YouTube viewer, Jorge uh, Apont. How does digitization improve cost and efficiency of the Crossrail project? And uh, I think that's partly in your slides, but maybe you could go over it briefly again. And then mm. he asks, how has the pandemic affected the design of the spaces within the rail line? Are there any new tools, systems that were used in this project you could highlight in that regard. And did the pandemic have an effect on how you design the air ducts and the ventilation? And if it didn't in this project, uh, how do you think it would affect a future project? Hmm. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so the, the first part of the question, obviously, uh, uh, I can have a crack at. So yeah, I mean the the use of of, of creating all of the information that we did, uh, as I said, was it allowed us to understand what we were going to do before we did it, uh, so that we could then prove that what we were going to do wasn't going to cause any problems. We weren't going to encounter any clashes, any risks. We weren't going to run into infrastructure that was buried in the ground that we didn't know about, uh, and that would improve the the the. The, the actual time or you know, reduce the time that it would take to do these tasks whilst doing it more safely uh, and more efficiently. Uh, I mean, ultimately, that, that's what it was all about. I mean, some sense, like I said, the, the collection of the asset information, it's not going to, it's not going to benefit us in terms of the construction. Um, but obviously, once you move into operations and maintenance with, uh, uh, with the inf information they've got, it's going to make it much easier to, to manage that railway going forwards. So the second part of the question, um, uh, basically, it doesn't, it hasn't, because we were designed and finished before before mm. COVID-19 hit. It's affected, obviously, our construction, but um, we stood down for a very short period of time. And then because of the stage we were at in the program, we're able to get back up and running quite quickly and exercise, you know, uh, social distancing on sites and work with the right uh, protective equipment but in terms of the design it's happened too late for us to to uh, to um, change the design of the program as the the railway as a result um, it may mm -hmm. change the way it operates that's something for rail for london to to consider in terms of um uh you know making space on the trains um so unfortunately i can't answer that question really um, um but yeah i'm sure the the next railway after us is considering that very very uh very much uh, uh, Jorge's in Colombia, and he, he had a comment on YouTube about the <clears throat> the construction of a uh, underground in Bogota. I wondered if you had uh, had any conversations with anybody or uh, there. I think it's being built by Chinese. Um, That's a 
government that, assistance? Th that's a very interesting point because um, what has happened- oh, I'm sorry, it's not an underground, it's an elevated, but- Yeah. Um, the Department for Transport has an organization called Crossrail International, which is trying to use the, uh, the positive um, uh, experience of the early stages of the program, particularly in terms of setting up the scheme, to um, to be an export um, uh, um, uh, ambassadorship for the UK. And Bogota is one of the the, the um, uh, systems, and the Colombian government is one that that Crossrail International is already working with. Yeah, that was a, another question. So there is an international effort to uh, make. I guess, capitalize on what you have developed and learned. Yes, I mean, it's a separate organization mm -hmm. at Crossrail itself, but people that were involved in Crossrail are part of it. Um, and uh, it will, it's, uh, it's, tr it's building um, uh, connections all over the world, particularly in Australia, actually. Ah. Is there any attempt by Crossrail to monetize what uh, software tools you've developed? Uh, no, because... On a, and a goodwill nonprofit. Uh, yeah, no, we're, we're 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 essentially we're a government company, so that's not we, we will we will cease to exist probably the year after next. Um, mm. and, uh, yeah, the uh, what we've built gets passed on to the to the future schemes within the government major projects portfolio. Is, is all of the software and the source code a uh, public domain? Oh well, I don't think so. But that stands. No. We're, uh, most most of what we did was using proprietary software. A lot of this stuff, we didn't build the software ourselves. We just used existing software that was out there uh, and customized or configured it to, to our needs. Um, uh, some of the vendors will have taken some of the development tasks that we did within their software and taken it away uh, and reused it uh, for other purposes. Uh, but it, that's not something that we would, we would, would have been involved with. Uh uh, PSW member David Rabinowitz asked, with the massive web-based database, were there any attempts by outside entities to infiltrate the system? What kind of security systems were used and how early in the project were they implemented? I'm not sure I could answer that one. Um, I don't, I mean, we, we, we obviously, I, I don't, I've not seen anything about any, any infiltration or attempted infiltration of our systems, uh, whether that's because it hasn't occurred or whether I just don't know about it. Um, uh, we have standard uh, IT security in place uh, to prevent uh, access from outside. And a lot of the stuff we built sat inside of our network. So um, you would have to get through our firewalls in order to get to it in the first place. Um, there have been attempts at, at phishing and, and spam uh, uh, operations against us, but I, I don't think anything um, anything serious. Uh, I don't know if you know of anything more than that, Simon. I'm afraid not. You're outside okay. our area of expertise there, I'm afraid. Yeah. Yeah, certainly, like I said, a lot of stuff was hosted by us um, uh, and therefore it, it, it was within our purview to, to, to manage and, and maintain and protect it. And we had a, a third party uh, IT support agency that would help us with that. Yeah, I imagine the fear would be corrupting the information in a way that no. would be dangerous for the operation of the system. Yeah, I do you know, but uh, obviously, it, it, as, as part, things like that. Yeah, I mean, as part of the standard IT infrastructure, you know, obviously, we would have had backups and uh, we had um, uh, uh, fail oversights uh, where we could we could fall back on if if there were any issues with corruption of data. Um, so it wasn't as if it was just existed once and 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 if that went we would we were lost uh, we could have switched over to to backup facilities al ehrlich has a question psw member uh, al yeah um i was wondering i know nothing about the geology of the london area is it sedimentary rock or granite and to what extent is the the design that you folks use dependent on this. It, I imagine that those different uh, kinds of substrate have different strengths, different op not optical, sonic properties, sound absorption, and so on. Um, so for starters, what's, what's the soil like underneath uh, London? As I say, for the vast majority of it, it is clay. And it's quite a, quite a dense and homogeneous clay. 
Um, and that is just the absolute best possible medium to dig with a tunnel boring machine. Um, and it's what makes the uh, sprayed concrete lined platform tunnels easy to do as well, because you can excavate it and it holds itself up until the, the, the sprayed concrete that you spray up goes off and, and, and holds, the, holds the, uh, the, the, the clay back. Um, it's not rock, so it doesn't require blasting. Um, and it's not sand, gravel, chalk, things which, which have, uh, once you've excavated them, create greater amounts of settlement and, and don't hold themselves up. And so it's extremely easy to, to dig through. Um, and um, it's also quite, um, uh, in terms of the, the, the noise and vibration, the, the amount, the, le the depth at which we were digging our tunnel and mm. the, uh, the way that we build the um, the, the railway and the resilient track and the, the, the even the standard track is quite um, uh, uh, absorbing of, 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 of vibration um, means that it was unlikely to be a massive problem anyway. Um, so yeah, ideal is basically the answer. But it sounds like the strength of the tunnel um, and, and the strength of the, the interstitials between your tunnel and other structures that are pre-existing depend on, on your concrete. Right, there's nothing. Clay isn't very strong, I don't think, is it? Uh, well, it, it does. It's 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 much more incompressible than sand and gravel. Okay. Thank you very much. So Bruce Murray has a question. Uh, I think partially answered in in your last uh, part of of the talk, Simon. But uh, go ahead, Bruce. Um, I just wondered if you ran across any um, interesting archaeological ruins or maybe even a few paleontological things while you were digging. We did, in fact. Um, I wouldn't say much of it was massively unexpected because we the, London's quite well known and quite well archaeologically mapped as it is. So we brought in the Museum of London Archaeology Service as our overall archaeological um, uh, contractor. Um, and we do huge desk studies before we start. For example, we knew that the Bedlam burial ground was there at Liverpool Street. Uh, what we didn't know was quite how many bodies there would be. Um, we did find uh, two quite interesting paleontological finds. One was in the dock at Canary Wharf, which was a mammoth bone. Uh, and we also found a bit of prehistoric amber, but without any mosquitoes, so we couldn't pull a Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> Were you, for the most part, was your digging mostly too far down to run into those sorts of things? Yeah, the, the, the running tunnels and the platform tunnels are 17 to 25 meters. And really the, the human impact on the ground is absolutely in the top three, uh, top three meters. Obviously modern buildings have foundations which go deeper, but for the vast majority of the history of London, no one's digging deeper than about three meters below ground. So our station sites, um, we did have um, archaeology, but actually, at most of our station sites, we were knocking down buildings that were already there and rebuilding them. So that that ground had already been churned over many times. So it was only the places where we were digging into completely new ground. For example, Stepney Green, um, uh, where we found the remains of, a, of an old manor house. Um, Liverpool Street, because that uh, Bedlam Hot Hospital, that's station is actually in a road rather than on the site of an existing building. Um, at Tottenham Court Road we found uh, the remains of a factory that was a, a, a jam factory but we knew that jam factory was going to be there we just weren't expecting the sheer number of broken jam pots from, <laughs> from, from the sort of 1800s uh, through to the early 1900s. Was there any jam left? <laughs> um, there is actually, and I think it may still be online, a, um, an interactive tour of the uh, archaeology of the project, which was done with the Museum of London in Docklands. Oh, uh, right. And I might be able to find a link and you can share that um, with, with people because that's quite that would be uh, great. We'll put it up. Good. On it was a very good exhibition. The minutes. So there's a couple more questions. One, one is actually mine. I was wondering why you chose overhead uh, electrification versus third rail systems that are used in, for instance, New York and here in DC? Yeah, uh, well, mainly because it's an existing national railway service for most of its length. 
and in uh, both sides of London, except for the very last bit from Heathrow out to Reading, it already had overhead line electrification. So if we had to go third rail, we would have had to re-electrify those right. bits. Okay. So what we're really doing is expending, extending that overhead line into the center, into the center. An overhead line is better anyway, because it has, it's less lossy because it operates at a higher voltage. Uh. It's also safer because it's out of reach. And, and how portable is, is the BM? BIMS system that you put together to other infrastructure projects would basically they have to recode and, and recustomize or could they take your shell and, and start plugging their own data into it? Assuming yeah, well, it follows I, your standards. Yeah, again, so th these were <clears throat> for the most part proprietary software. So um, you could take the stuff that we had and you could plug it into uh, another project very easily. And we were already seeing that uh, there's another project called High Speed 2, uh, which is another big rail infrastructure project, which is taking off uh, 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 and starting to build now, uh, going sort of from London up through, through Birmingham to Manchester. And that is already using a lot of the same stuff that we did. And we, there's already been a lot of lessons learned passed over uh, to them about uh, how they manage their data and their, their asset information in particular. Um, so, yeah, there's the, again, there's, there's nothing that they would have to do particularly uh, differently from us. And I think, to be honest, the software <clears throat> has evolved since we started using it. Um, uh, as, as, as I mentioned, some of the software we're using now is quite old. And actually, there's better software out there to do the job than, than what we're using. Um, but it's just this project's been going for 10 years. Theoretically better. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I just upgraded a 64-bit uh, yeah. operating system and... Uh, and uh, application programs, and, and my computer's running about 50% slower. <laughs> Thanks to Microsoft and uh, Apple. Anyway, <laughs> we have a last question here from James Van Arstelem, which I'll read. Uh, James says, you described tunneling with narrow tolerances between existing structures. I'm surprised that extremely precise data exists on old buildings so that you can determine exactly where the footings are. What's the nature of these databases? What entity owns and manages them? How is data acquired on very old buildings? And he says, great presentation, thank you. Okay, um, probably we may have been, um, uh, what's the word? Um, we may have created an expectation there that, that might, not be the, might, might not be the case. The threading the eye of the needle was between the, the infrastructure above we'd just built. So that was ours. <laughs> um, <laughs> the Northern Line, um, obviously London Underground has a very good idea of where its tunnels are. They're well, well surveyed. Um, so for specifically for that issue, we had very good data about where, where the, 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 um, the assets were in the ground. Um, elsewhere, there were certainly cases where we didn't know, but as I said before, for the vast majority of our tunneling, we are a long way below ground. Um, the buildings that we had to avoid uh, because the, tunnel, the, boring, the, the um, foundations were uh, as deep as the railway are very, very modern buildings. They're the ones which are the tallest and therefore we know we know where they are because they they we can find as built for those the the landowners are the ones that hold those those building those uh, records but so do the local authorities so when you do the desk study you go to the local authority and you can go back to the planning applications for uh, particularly the large buildings which have quite most recently been built in london so for example um at um canary wharf our station is inside one of the docks that was left from when Docklands was redeveloped. Um, so it avoids all the piled foundations of the very large buildings that have been built in the area. Um, and we, uh, and so we are basically in a, in a pile free area. We did, however, find some inclined piles, which we weren't expecting, um, which were the uh, footings for the original dock cranes. We thought all those piles for the, for the foundations for the cranes went straight down, but we found some um, inclined ones and had to cut them out. Luckily, of course, the cranes were no longer there, so they weren't holding anything up. So you just, TBM hits metal sleeve of a pile, you stop, back it off, and go in and cut it out, and then start again. Um, 
and I think of any other examples, we did hit a well. We hit a well at Tottenham Court Road, which we weren't expecting because it wasn't charted. Uh, but the first you know about that is the bricks are coming out of the tunnel boring machine and it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, it had already been capped at a higher level, so it didn't cause any problems at ground level. It's very interesting. It's a pleasure to have uh, you two to talk about this. You have obviously an encyclopedic knowledge of the software and, and, uh, and the actual construction. And uh, I thank you very, very much for, for staying up this late and for presenting this, uh, this overview of the, uh, of the project. Uh, so um, you all, you both have a rain check to come when you're in DC, if, you're, if you ever get over here. To, uh, to come and join uh, PSW at the, at the Cosmos Club for dinner, reception and a lecture if you're interested. And even if it's not on a day that's convenient when we're having a lecture, um, we'll arrange something as a small token of thanks for spending the time with us and putting together this presentation. So I really appreciate it. And uh, I think I'll let you guys get some sleep. <laughs> yeah. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Good night. Good night. Thank you everyone for joining us. The recording of tonight's lecture will be available to everyone on the PSW YouTube channel. And in due course on Vimeo and via the PSW website. Please share the links with your friends and subscribe to the channel for notification on new postings. And don't hesitate to join. It's easy to apply for membership using the join button on the PSW website homepage. And please keep in mind that we have fared through this year of COVID fairly well, but new memberships have not been at the level of past years. And I would urge all PSW members to seek out others who might like to be members. And those of you who enjoy PSW on YouTube and are not members to please join. It's really important for PSW to keep up its membership and to expand its membership. So thank you. Before you go, some closing announcements. First of all, the next meeting, number 2440, will be on May 7th. The speaker will be Tony Tyson, distinguished professor of astronomy at UC Davis and chief scientist at the Rubin Large Synoptic Survey Telescope Observatory. He will be speaking about the potential impacts of satellite constellations like SpaceX Starlink on astronomical observations and on ways to mitigate these adverse effects. The 2,441st meeting will be on May 21. The speaker will be Bill Powell of the State University of New York College of Environmental Sciences and Forestry. He will be speaking about the chestnut blight and approaches to bringing back a blight resistant American chestnut tree. The 2442nd meeting will be on June 4th and will feature the annual Joseph Henry lecture. The speaker will be Carlo Ravelli, director of the quantum gravity group at the Center for Theoretical Physics in Marseille, Marseille France and distinguished visiting research chair at the Perimeter Institute. He will be speaking on quantum gravity. The 2,443rd meeting, capstoning the spring lecture series, will be on June 18th. The speaker will be Steve Stitch, program manager of NASA's commercial crew program. He will be speaking on the US commercial crew program and human spaceflight. Changes to the spring lecture series, should there be any, and lectures coming this fall will be posted to the PSW website. Check there often for updates. And with that, before you go, please join me in thanking tonight's crew, James, Anne, Robin, and Cameo for producing tonight's event. I will now adjourn the 2,439th meeting of the society in its 150th year. I wish everyone a good evening.
meeting is adjourned.